Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Benjamin Dykes about his new translation of the work of Abu Mashar, who was an astrologer that lived in the 9th century. And this book is titled uh, On the Revolutions of the Years of Nativities, which is a medieval approach to doing solar return charts. Uh, so this episode was recorded on Friday, August 2nd, 2019, starting at 4.19 p.m. in Denver, Colorado, and this is the 218th episode of the show. For more information about how to subscribe to the podcast and help support the production of future episodes by becoming a patron, please visit theastrologypodcast.com slash subscribe. Uh, hey, Ben, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so you're back again already. We just talked a few months ago with your landmark translation of the Book of Nativities of Saul bin Bisher, and you're already back with another huge translation, this time of the main work on solar returns by Abu Mashar. Yeah, it's been a number of years that I've been working on both of these books. And yeah. I'm happy to have it done. <laughs> when did you start working on this book, this translation? I want to say maybe three or four years ago. Okay, so three or four years. Yeah, because somebody, uh, a friend sent me a text today when I posted that I was doing this interview on Instagram saying um, something to the effect that, how does he translate books faster than I can read them? But the the answer to that is that not that you're a, like, like I like to say, a machine sent from the future to translate all the existing astrological texts, but you just are actually working on them behind the scenes over a very extended period of time, and then sometimes they just all come out relatively close together. Right. Yeah. I am usually, I usually have about three things in the works at any given time. Okay. All right. Well, let's jump into it with this book. Um, so this is a book by the ninth century astrologer Abu Mashar. Um, who, for listeners that aren't familiar with that astrologer, who is Abu Mashar? Well, he was a Persian astrologer who was writing in the 800s AD during the Abbasid Caliphate or dynasty. So this is the famous dynasty in Baghdad that um, the earlier generation before him had included people like uh, Masha'Allah and Umar al-Tabari and uh, so Saul bin Bisher would have been a contemporary of his, uh, maybe a slightly older contemporary uh, in Baghdad. Okay, so he's living and working in Baghdad, and he became, from my understanding, the most well-known and perhaps the most prolific astrologer of the Middle Ages, right? Yeah, his, so many of his works are preserved, uh, whereas even people a generation before him uh, we only know the titles of some of their works, but he was uh, famous enough and, and his works were popular enough that a lot of his material has survived. Okay. And I've seen a list that says there's maybe over 40 titles or something crazy like that that are known that he had was said to have written. You're right. Okay. Um, but in terms of some of those are like longer books and some of those are shorter books. Um, but there, I think there was at least three major, really long and detailed works that he wrote, right? Well, there was, uh, there was the Great Introduction, uh, which is a very famous one that was translated into Latin. Um, the book on re uh, religions and dynasties, also known as On the Great Conjunctions, that was also translated into Latin. That's a mundane book. Uh, and then there was a bunch of others. Um, this one that we're talking about today was only partly translated into Latin, but some other ones were as well. Okay. And this is a book um, primarily on solar returns or what you call solar revolutions, but it actually uh, contains his treatment of a number of different timing techniques, right? Yeah. The, um, the, um, ever since antiquity, and Ptolemy talks about this, uh, astrologers would use several techniques every year, uh, or they would check in on the same techniques from time to time. And so by Abu Mashar's day, there was several techniques that they would look at every year. So when they talk about a solar revolution, it does mean a solar return or a solar return chart uh, specifically, but it's, it's really several techniques at once. Right, because it's not just the return, but he's also doing 
perfections and primary directions and like sort of variations of transits and a number of different things. Right. And distributions through the bounds or terms, along with some other things that I have a feeling he didn't practice. Uh, but in at least one case, he says he wants to include it in order to be complete. Okay, brilliant. Uh, and here is just to share the the cover. This is what the cover of the book looks like for those that are watching the video version. And so you actually, this is similar to Saul. And for those that didn't listen to the Saul episode, maybe we could re recapitulate some of that. Where um, your original language background was in Latin, and for a number of years you were translating medieval astrological text from Latin. Uh, but you, in the earlier part of this decade, decided to go back and learn Arabic so you could go back and start translating some of the earlier sources that the Latin translators were drawing on, right? Yeah, because and and I'm, I won't say that I won't uh, uh, translate Latin anymore, but for so many, so much of this material, there were things that were lost in the uh, translation from Arabic to Latin, and in Arabic you get more of a a richer vocabulary and a more well a more accurate picture of what they were doing because you're reading the actual uh, works that the medievals only knew uh, in Latin translation. So that's that's my main project now is to continue in Arabic. Right, because I was reading um, Burnett's introduction, Bar Burnett and Yamamoto's introduction to the the Great Introduction today, and they were saying there were two separate Latin. Translations of the Greater Introduction in like the 12th century, and that the styles of both the translators were markedly different. And it was interesting how they were describing them, but that that really sort of explains why it's important to go back to the original source because sometimes the original language there can be a lot of subtleties and nuance that are lost in the translation when the translator has to make judgment calls or brings their own um, sort of stylistic approach to things. Yeah, and it, it's. In some cases, uh, the the information is the same. Like if you're saying uh, if Mars is in the seventh, then the spouse will be like this. That's a pretty simple thing. Mm -hmm. But when you get to some of the technical stuff, uh, like when planets are angular or succedent or cadent and and other things like that, um, the Arabs and Persians were sometimes very precise in the language that they used. But the Latins were not so precise, so um, there is a there are several different terms uh, that in Latin are called cadent or falling. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you only read the Latin, you're not sure. You might think they're all talking about the same thing, but in the Arabic, they're talking about totally different things. So it's good to to go back and understand the earlier vocabulary. Sure, and and so that's part of what you did here because this is a book that you translated partially from the Latin years ago, back in 2010, and that was um, originally part of your Persian Nativities series, which is Persian Nativities three on solar revolutions, uh, the Green Book or one of the Green Books. Um, but that was a translation of um, portions of Abu Mashar's solar return wor work from the Latin, right? Not from the original Arabic, right? Um the the original arabic has 9 books in it 9 parts to it and only 5 of them and a little bit of the ninth one uh were translated into latin so books 6 7 8 and most of 9 were completely missing and they were unknown to the medieval latins and it's where some of the most interesting material is so i had translated persian nativities 3 I translated that Latin, that partial Latin version. Now, in Persian Nativities 4, this is the complete version from Arabic. And um, I was, in some cases, really surprised or blown away by the material that was in here. Okay, so it was not just that there were several books missing from the Latin version, so that the one you did previously was, was incomplete and wasn't the entire work. So this represents almost like twice as much information as the previous book, but there was also a lot of like subtle linguistic nuances and details in the original Arabic that um, were not in the Latin that surprised you and that were like a welcome thing that you found in doing this translation. 
Yeah, I'm. Uh, I, we can see with this uh, that we, from the Arabic that um, Abu Mashar has some very interesting and sophisticated ideas about um, predictive techniques. Uh, he makes a lot of thoughtful observations about life um, and the way some of his examples come out in the Arabic with a clarity that was missing in the Latin. The Latin would be kind of garbled and you weren't you weren't sure what he was getting at, uh, but everything is so clear um, and vivid in in the Arabic edition. Okay. Um, and let's place this in a historical context, because I think that's one of the things that's most important and most interesting is that this is probably, I want to say, the most important book on solar returns in the history of astrology, which sounds like kind of a big statement, um, but I think that might arguably be true because one of the issues you run into when you're studying the Hellenistic tradition, which which I specialize in, which is like the first thousand years of Western astrology, is we see these little references to solar returns in passing, but there's no surviving treatments of the topic that are super detailed or, or go into all the details about how exactly solar return charts were treated, so that it was always kind of a mysterious topic. Um, and I think Robert Schmidt, who translated a lot of the Greek astrological material, ran into that issue so that in the late 90s, he decided to translate part of Abu Mashar that survived in a Greek translation and published that in 1999 as a partial translation of Abu Mashar on solar returns so that he could get to some of their solar return material with, with a treatment of it. Um, yeah, so that's probably good evidence that Abu Mashar is probably one of the first, like, really major comprehensive works on solar returns, right? I think definitely we can definitely see that from the Arabic, and he himself, uh, in a couple of places in the book, says as much. Um, now he is not known for his modesty, uh, but he does say that um, his predecessors have all done little partial treatments of solar revolutions but they often have not coordinated the techniques together or talked about the differences or, uh, let's say, with uh, monthly revolutions, that is, um, not just annual techniques, but monthly techniques. Some of them would only make references or it was incomplete. And so he, he says, I've looked at all of the material and what I'm doing is something that no one has ever done before. Um, we don't know exactly how much he was taking from his predecessors, because that would have been common. But I, looking at this, I take him at his word that he is doing something new and thorough in a way that I don't think has been done since. I can't think of a book on these predictive techniques um, that matches this. Yeah, and in terms of, so not just in terms of the earlier tradition, this would be one of the first great works on solar returns, but also in terms of the tradition after him, after the ninth century, this still is like the major, probably most comprehensive or most detailed work on solar returns, even for many centuries after that. Yeah, and it's a it's a terrible shame that some of these some of the later books were just missing and never made it to the into the um the Latin West because it meant there were centuries of astrologers that were missing out on techniques that um, he has very well developed. Uh, so it's a shame uh, that that for such uh, for such a contribution to astrology, you know, practically half the book was missing. Sure. Well, and it was not a light book. This is like a really, in your translation, a thick, you know, uh, what six or seven hundred seven hundred page book um, dealing with. Solar returns in pretty much every way that you could possibly approach the subject, um, and you also wrote a really detailed, hundred plus page introduction in order to try to sort through it because he's so comprehensive that it seemed like you were you were a little almost nervous that readers might get lost, and so you tried to write a guide to how to approach and how to tackle this book in the beginning. Yeah, the the uh, I felt like if I just kind of uh, translated the book and sort of dumped it on the public, uh, it, uh, people would get confused and frustrated. Uh, and so the introduction is, it's a long introduction to all the techniques, but I've also um, 
As I went along, I coordinated lots of different passages and sentences together and put them into what I call reading tables, so that um, as you read my description of the technique and how he thinks about the technique, I then give you a table tell, that tells you which sentences and paragraphs to read in the book so that you can, you can dip in and out of the book and read what he actually has to say to go along with my guide. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and I found that really helpful and useful, especially for later reference. I can see how that's going to be useful when people want to focus in on specific techniques or specific approaches to solar return charts, having that sort of like list of which chapters and which par paragraphs or passages to focus on is going to be really handy. Um, so let's see, I'm looking at where should we start here in terms of in terms of this and in terms of approaching solar return charts, maybe we should define our subject in terms of the, the whole technical approach here. What is a solar return chart and how do we calculate it according to Abu Mashar? A uh, solar return chart is, uh, and, and all the techniques that we again uh, uh, revisit uh, every year. Um, it takes place at the moment that the sun returns to his natal position. So if your natal sun was at 15 Gemini, then at every year when he returns to 15 Gemini, you cast that chart. And that is the uh, chart taken in real time uh, at his return, and other techniques like perfections begin at that moment as well. Okay, so this is the the astrological birthday chart, basically, not your, yeah. not necessarily always your exact uh, calendar birthday, but it's that your your astronomical birthday when the sun returns back to its exact natal position it held at the moment of your birth. Yes, exactly. Okay, so a, a chart is cast, and um, a chart is cast for that, and then w what is the motivation for this? Like one of the inter interesting discussions you have at the beginning of the book is why Abu Mishra actually defends why solar returns are necessary and has this sort of like elaborate philosophical backdrop, right? Yeah, his idea is that um, you have your nativity, but in order to check in on the nativity again, you need to have something that is like a completed cycle. In which the uh, uh, the chart that the real time chart that you're using, like revolution, has enough similarity or conceptual similarity to the nativity that you can say uh, that the natal topics are being renewed, that it's a good time to revisit them. And so one of the things he says is that uh, the sun goes through a full cycle of seasons. And so uh, when the sun returns to his natal position, you are sort of renewing, uh, you are renewing the chart. Uh, so that's one of the things that he says. Uh, rather than doing, um, I mean, there are other things, some people do, you know, lunar return charts. He doesn't agree with that kind of thing. Uh, he thinks you need to use the sun because the sun's motion defines the year. Okay, so and, and the part and the parts of the year. Got it. Okay, um, and there was sort of this breakdown about like time and notions of like the nativity being on this level of of like timelessness, uh, perfections having a sort of symbolic approach to time, and the solar return and transits having a sort of real real time approach to time, right? Yeah, um, I wonder if before we get into that, because that's the that gets into his theory of of what prediction is. Mm -hmm. um, there are some other things that people uh, talk about with solar revolutions, and that is things like uh, where do you cast the chart for? Right? Do you process the chart? And so, as long as we're talking about the mechanics of it, um, there's no evidence that they relocated charts. Uh, it looks like they used the natal location for all of the solar returns. Okay, so is um, that relocating charts is more of like a modern development in like the twentieth century, perhaps? I don't know if it's twentieth. I'm trying to think if Moran, uh, the French astrologer from the fifteen 
hundreds. I think he might have relocated his solar revolutions, but there's no evidence I've ever seen that the um, that the ancients or medievals did. And uh, I noticed uh, you referenced Marinus at one point in this text. Have you you read that entire thing in Latin? Just as a side note, no. Okay, no, uh, uh-uh. not the whole was, thing. <laughs> okay. I was just curious if that was ever on the docket as a thing to do it at some point. Some of those later, like Latin Renaissance era works. Some of some of the later Latin stuff, but um, uh, I'm not sure yet. I've I've got a big uh, docket of other of other things um, that I'm working on, especially in Arabic first. Yeah, there's no shortage of like other texts you're trying to translate. Yeah, and plus also uh, there are there's plenty of stuff like James Holden has translated. Um, a lot of the Moran material, along with uh, Anthony Lewis, and um, so I'm not in a rush to, you know, I would I would like to translate some of that material, but I'm in no rush. Uh, I'd like to explore some of this new, unknown Arabic material uh, before I start thinking about that. That makes sense. All right, so um, no no relocated charts. He doesn't relocate the solar return chart. He uses the natal position for the solar return. And then the other one was uh, to precess, do precession correction or not? Right, and there again, there's no evidence that they did uh, precession correction. Okay, that makes things much simpler. I, I've heard somebody say yeah. at one point, like if you're going to do pr- precession correction, that you almost might as well just be using like the sid- sidereal zodiac at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. There's no evidence that they that they did that. Even if they were using a, well, I mean, they, um, hmm, the zodiacs that they used, that's a little controversial. Sometimes they used tropical, some used sidereal, because they they were combining old uh, Indian tables with uh, newer, or with, you know, Ptolemaic tables. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they would have a sidereal zodiac that they seemed to apply little corrections to, but there's there's nothing there's nothing I've never seen any discussion not Abu Mashar certainly about how you need to process uh, a revolution it's just every year at the return uh, natal location okay um, and that brings up an interesting point where you're pointing out that they're he was drawing on they're drawing on sometimes like Indian tables and Persian tables and like Greek tables for different things. And Abu Mashar, it seems like almost even more than any other astrologer, is drawing on so much of the earlier tradition and like synthesizing pieces of the Hellenistic and the um, like Persian and Indian and early Arabic traditions into one sort of synthesis, right? In terms of techniques, yeah, just in terms or, of the the period that he occupies, the role that he occupies in history, and the extent to which. He's drawing like pieces almost from a number of those different traditions. Yeah, in terms of astronomy, he he discusses and, and talks in this book. He talks about some of the values and and he names uh, and talks about some of the uh, astronomical values in uh, uh, the Sindh Hind, which is an Indian uh, book of tables, uh, Ptolemy, uh, the Zijal Shah, which is a Persian. Uh, Zij that went through some very uh, some additions, so he he knew all about these and is said to have written his own Zij or or book of tables. Um, but in terms of techniques too, uh, he talks about something called the ninth parts, and he claims that he is working from Indian books, which I don't even know if they exist anymore. Yeah, I mean, well, the Navamsha is still a huge subdivision. That's like the main subdivision used in Indian astrology. Yeah, but he uh, and I don't know any. I don't know anything about how Indian astrologers use it. But the the way that he describes it, very intricate. Um, uh, I have no doubt he was working from real books from the time. Um, it's it's a, it's an interesting technique. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but yeah, he was he was aware he was aware of everything that everyone was doing and had access to all of these books. Sure. Okay. Um, are there any other in terms of calculation? I guess that's the basic things. I guess we we also know about that weird 
solar lunar solar lunar return that Valens does, and that shows up as like a fragment in Dor- that got inserted into Dorotheus. But um, that's not something that Abu Mashar does, right? Well, for um, he um, in one part of the book, he talks about some monthly methods and he rejects them. And one of them is Ptolemy's. He rejects Ptolemy. One of them, I believe, is that Valens, or maybe Valens' version that you see in Dorotheus. Uh, I believe he rejects that. Um, so he talks about some methods that he rejects, and then others that he sort of offers as a, like a, it's like a menu of many things that many people have said. Okay. Um, are there any other things in terms of the calculation or the basic erection of the solar return chart? I thought it was interesting at the very beginning of the text. He says, um, cast a circle chart or cast a square chart, which I thought was interesting because so much of the later medieval and Renaissance tradition got into using square charts that it was almost assumed that that was the standard traditional layout. But right there in the text, he he sort of leaves it open and says it's like a stylistic choice. You could do either one. Yeah, so people must have been doing uh, uh, different shapes of charts uh, for whatever reason. I don't know which one would have been more popular, but certainly in the manuscripts that got passed on, I think they're all square. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. So, are there anything else about calculating the solar return chart? No, that I think that's it for the for the mechanics of it. Okay. Um, so should we step into interpretation or where you would start with the interpretation? Are there any other like philosophical bases that we should cover first? No, I think I think his theory of prediction starts to get right into it. Okay. Um, so what is that? What is his theory of prediction for solar return charts? Well, let me start by saying that um, nowadays uh, we have a kind of live and let live attitude towards predictive techniques. You sort of people sort of gravitate to the ones that they like, and now that we know about all sorts of time lord techniques, some people, uh, you know, just like using a time lord technique. And in fact, in book one, he talks about people other astrologers who don't believe in using things like solar revolutions and think that you can only use, you can just stick with time lords right which is well, sometimes a debate that comes up today like do we even need to do solar return charts mhm so apparently this was a debate that was happening in his day and parts of book 1 are his response to this in fact throughout his whole book he returns to this theme and um, so, the, his basic message is that uh, you need both time lords and a solar revolution. Uh, you need at least, and I would say you need at least one of each. So he he, you can think of all of these in three categories. Think of three different types of techniques or charts. Each one has its own kind of time. The nativity. Uh, is a chart taken at birth. And we can think of it as timeless in the sense that it doesn't change. It's there with you for your whole life. It is static and unchanging. Then at the other extreme, you have real-time techniques like solar returns or revolutions and transits. Those are real-time techniques uh, taken later on in life at certain times. Then in the middle, you have your time lords. And time lords, although they're in the middle, they're more closely aligned with the nativity because what they do is they apply symbolic time to the natal chart. So with the natal chart, you have a the timeless natal chart but then you have these time lords that symbolically apply time to them. And so the, the classic example would be profections. Uh, in profections, we take some place in the chart, usually the ascendant, and we just move it forward by one sign, 
uh, one for one year at a time, one sign per year, and we keep going around the chart. Now, nothing in the natal chart changes. We are just, so to speak, pointing our finger at a different thing each year as we move around. That's applying a kind of symbolic time. So the nativity and time lords are very closely connected. But at the other extreme are the, uh, I'll, we'll just say solar revolutions and just assume that transits are part of it. Those are the real time techniques. So this is the basic structure he has. And the way to understand, um, for, for the skeptic of solar revolutions, which he was referring to, he was debating, this is the basic idea. Uh, your natal chart is only a picture of birth. It only indirectly refers to later events and what their qualities will be. But a lot of things in life take place over time, or they happen once or twice. They might repeat at different times. So that if we're looking at the nativity and trying to predict something about life generally, well, events only happen when the real-time conditions for them are right. And the only way to measure real-time conditions is with a real-time technique. So therefore, in order to refer to anything that will actually happen later in life, you need an astrology technique that will assess what is actually happening at that time. So you need revolutions in order to even understand whether and how the natal promise will be activated. Right, that makes sense because the birth chart is like this fixed thing from long ago that was promising something at the moment of birth, or oftentimes mm -hmm. promising very specific things. But um, yeah, but that was not connected where, like, 30 years later, the question is, like, what are the present circumstances or what is the weather outside and how does that relate to the, the potentiality that the birth chart held? Right. Um, and you might, or for example, you might have a technique like distributions through the bounds. Now these assign time lords, let's say, for a period of six years. You might have the same time lord for six years. Well, six years is a long time for a certain event to be predicted. So, and over six years, conditions can change a lot. So we need a real-time technique to see what is actually happening during those six years to pinpoint whether and how the conditions are right for it to happen. So um, the solar revolution, these real-time techniques, act as a kind of filter for what is projected out of the nativity. Uh, if the conditions in the solar revolution are, uh, are contrary to what you're predicting, then you're looking at an event that is maybe hindered or doesn't turn out quite how you think, even though it's happening. But if the real-time conditions are very good, you might end up with a situation that is even better than you expected, based on the nativity. Okay, so the solar return kind of becomes the the last or the third point in a succession of uh, things that you're looking at. It's like you have the natal chart, then you have the time lords, and then you have the solar return chart. And the solar return chart can help to confirm and accentuate um, certain things that might be indicated by the, the previous two. Yes, and, um, and, and there's a, there's a What we then need to do is give an explanation for why time lords are necessary, but there's a strange, kind of a strange consequence that comes from this idea of needing a real-time um, technique. And the first one, which is, it might be kind of unsettling at first, is that we can never actually experience our nativity. Because what do you mean by that? The 
the nativity is, again, in a sense, timeless. The conditions of the nativity only exist at birth. Mm. Uh, after that, things change. So although the nativity is describing the kind of life you, so to speak, ought to have, we humans live in the flow of time from one moment to the next. And so we can only experience things in real time and under real conditions. Uh, you know, th there might be something about your nativity, let's say, that describes your marriage. But if your marriage lasts 20 years, you can never uh, fully experience your marriage at any given time. We can only experience that year by year and moment by moment. So there's a strange, almost metaphysical divide that opens up between what the nativity is and our real lives as described through the solar revolutions. Mm. So we can never fully embody at any given time our nativity. All we can experience is either parts of it moment by moment, or we can experience it in greater or lesser degrees at any moment. So it's a, it's a life we're supposed to have. You could say it's decreed by the mind of God. It's a reflection of, of our place in the universe. And yet there's a kind of division between us and the nativity because we live in time. So it's like you're only experiencing those parts of your nativity that are activated in the moment, in the present, during the course of like the unfurling of time? Right, exactly. So you might, you might fully live out whatever your uh, nativity promises, let's say, for a marriage, but it unfolds over 20 years. So you can never experience it as a whole at any given time. And in each year, what you're seeing is that it is being expressed to a greater or lesser degree, or better or worse. It will never match exactly the static quality described in the nativity. Okay, interesting. So that's, yeah, that's getting to the heart of why the solar return is important and why it's sort of like a necessary technique in order to understand the unfolding of time and the immediate experience of it in terms of short increments of time in the native's life, like one year. Yeah, and it means that if you want to get more platonic or neoplatonic about it, you could say that uh, the nativity exists on a higher level of reality that has, obviously it took place at a certain time, so it's not completely timeless, but it's relatively timeless. And so we can never quite uh, grasp it or experience it fully. We are on the other side of a kind of metaphysical divide. We are fully in the flow of time. That makes sense. And, but, um, but what it, what it also means is that prediction becomes inevitable, because um, your nativity cannot can never fully make sense unless you compare it to the actual lived conditions in time. So you need a technique to do that. Prediction becomes inevitable. Yeah, it makes me think of that piece of artwork that A.T. Mann made back in like the 1970s that showed like the unfurling and the movement of the planets through the uh, in the solar system through like projected through time. Um, I'm going to actually share that from his website really quickly for those watching the video version of this. So it just shows because the the natal chart itself is just like a snapshot, uh, like a, a slice of where the planets are at that specific moment in time at the moment of birth. Uh, I think Bruce Schofield calls it like a time slice sometimes, but mm -hmm. What happens is that after that, you know, the planets keep moving, and they're not just moving relative to each other in their like circles around the sun, but they're also it's like the solar system itself is also moving through uh, the galaxy or moving through the universe in time and space as well. Yeah, and what I think the uh, the Neoplatonists would add 
and prob probably Abu Mashar would add, since he was in this kind of tradition, he would probably add that, um, that when you're talking about something like a natal chart, you're talking something that is, uh, you called it a time slice, it's a time slice that's a projection of the divine mind, that is a picture of your place in the divine mind. But the divine mind is static. The nativity is a temporal picture of that of that complete divine mind. But that because it has less time or a different kind of time, it exists at a higher level of reality. Mm. Right, like the for sort of fourth dimensional like aspect of things. If time is the fourth dimension, well, it's um, um, I guess uh, there might be a lot of ways to uh, characterize it, but um, it's it's one that we can understand, but we can't fully experience because we live in the flow of time. Right. Okay. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, we, we live in the flow of time and therefore we're just experiencing things moment to moment and not in their totality and like seeing the entire like birth, uh, growth, and then decay and eventual death of, of the human over the course of like a century as in its totality. Yeah, the nativity would be like a totality, but we can only experience that moment by moment and in terms of the more and the less. Got it. Okay. So that so that's that's the difference between the nativity and the real time techniques. But then we have to look at the time lords because you might ask, well why why do we need time lords then? Why don't we just start casting solar revolutions or tr or just ongoing transits if we're in the flow of time? And I think there's a good argument to be made for why we need uh, these Time Lords. And it's that if you, didn't have time, if you didn't have Time Lords, remember Time Lords tell you when certain places or planets become active or are the focus of attention. Uh, without that, if you just had ongoing transits or a solar revolution, Life would be like a blooming bush, uh, sort of uh, casting out in every direction all at once. So that you, if you didn't have an astrological way of saying that first you need to be a young person and then be educated, and first this happens, then the next, there would be no astrological way of determining uh, what things are happening. Uh, in what order in life. And so you could say of a baby, if you looked at the seventh house and its Lord, you could say that a baby at all moments is being married, divorced, having relationships, or the tenth house is having a career, losing a career, having a reputation. Everything would be happening simultaneously if all you had was unlimited real-time techniques all happening at once. So we need some way of, of taking that total nativity and we need some kind of symbolic time filter on it to say that, no, first this thing is important, then this thing is important, uh, so that we can say that some things happen before others. And that gives an intelligible order to life instead of everything all happening at once. Right, you've got to set up the table of contents of the book, or you've got to know which chapter that specific thing is going to take place in in the book um, before you can like really set up the sequence of the person's life. That's a good way to put it. Sure, yeah. Okay. You don't really have you don't really have a proper biography without time lords. Otherwise, everything is sort of happening all at once. Yeah. And that's one of the issues with natal astrology in its modern versions, where you basically just had like the natal chart and you had transits, and transits was the primary timing technique. And it was always the first timing technique everyone would go to, is there's always this assumption that, and it's something that new students of astrology get tripped up on, which is like reading a delineation. And then sometimes, especially if they're younger, not really resonating with it at first, or maybe thinking like that doesn't fit me. 
But then, you know, 10 or 20 years later, as the person gets older, suddenly that position gets activated by a time lord mm. technique, and suddenly that delineation and that placement fully comes into and, and manifests in a person's life and suddenly makes perfect sense, but it's something that might not earlier on before they've reached that chapter of their life. Yeah, exactly. And and because and and this helps then explain why he says that time lords are closer to the nativity, because they're taking the natal chart and identifying natal things uh, in a certain order. So time lords are in the middle of the three kinds of charts, but they're cl more closely aligned with the nativity and, dis and show which, which parts of this totality are, are active in, in what order. Okay, got it. So I don't know if it makes sense, if this breakdown would make sense as an analogy, but maybe it's like the nativity is the book of the native's life the which you can kind of like read the description on the back of the book and get a sense for what it might be about the time lords divide up the chapters of life but then it's almost like the soul returns and the transits are the individual sentences within those chapters that tell you what specifically then takes place within the individual chapters yeah and maybe the specific ups and downs of that time of life you might have for example say a biography and you're describing someone's years at school and you could say uh, that uh, it's successful and they get honors but year by year in that experience there will be ups and downs kind of like solar returns show ups and downs even though at the end the final judgment of it all is it was successful and there were honors okay right um, and we'll get into some specifics about, in terms of the techniques, how he actually has ways of determining that, like how there might be ups and downs in a in a more like localized time frame, just based on the solar return at shell, solar return at chart itself, in terms of emphasizing or de-emphasizing um, certain placements in the birth chart. Um, so this funny, this discussion is funny, and the fact that we're going to this whole philosophical discussion first, and the fact that he does, of course, because in his um, you know what we what little we know about him. He was supposed to be like a religious scholar for the first several decades of his life until he was um, somehow converted to astrology through some sort of connection with Al Kindi, who was one of the major Arabic philosophers, right? Yeah, Al Kindi was. Uh, he uh, had his own little translation circle going. He was a famous, uh, famous uh, philosopher and philosophical writer. Did some astrology writing, uh, seems to have maybe cast, cast some charts, not sure how many, but he, there are a couple of examples in one of his books. Uh, you've of you've translated charts. one of his books. Right. In the 40 chapters, there's a couple of uh, horary charts so that we can, uh, I believe I timed them to you know, sometime in the 800s during his life. And it's said that he. Um, he was challenged by Abu Mishar when Abu, before Abu Mishar understood astrology, and somehow Al Kindi got him to study astrology, and that changed everything. And then he became like the mo one of the most famous and influential astrologers <laughs> ever. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But we don't uh, know. Where there's some ambiguity, which you talk about in the introduction, about his like time frame or his birth date, because there's he unfortunately doesn't use example charts in this book. There's just one chart that he uses, which one scholar, David Pingree, thought that might be his birth chart, but you've argued against that being the case in your introduction, right? Yeah. Uh, the thing is, so there's a, a a chart example he uses with distributions. Uh, and the person was born in, I think, 786 or 787. Uh, he doesn't say whose chart it is. And then Al Nadim, a later uh, compiler and biographer, he was like a said bibliographer, that, like a book salesman or something, right? Uh, I can't remember, but he he wrote a but he wrote a big compendium of of Arabic literature. Uh, all the authors and what were the names of their books and and anecdotes about them. And uh, he says that um, Abu Mashar died in about 886 at the year one, 
uh, at 100 years old. So Pingree concluded that this was um, Abu Mashar's nativity, this example chart. And I, I took Pingree at his word when I translated Persian Nativities 3. And, uh, but I no, longer, I no longer believe that. And why is that? Uh, well, one reason, uh, there are a couple reasons, but one of the main reasons is that um, Abu Mashar's student, a guy named uh, Shadhan, yeah, he wrote a book of anecdotes about Abu Mashar. Uh, Abu Mashar used to teach, you could, I don't know if you'd call them master classes, but he would take clients and he would have a circle of students in the room with him who would watch him uh, interpret charts. So, and then they would ask him questions afterwards. And then Shadan was writing down some of the charts. So we have some, some of the client charts from these experiences and some of the dialogues they would have with Abu Mashar. Which is and amazing, by that, the way. Like you shared your preliminary translation of that with me, and it has these like great anecdotes. Like Abu Mashar was not a fan of Scorpios, for example, and he tells this one story about like making a prediction that this caravan or this group of people should not depart on this trip because the moon was like a void of course or applying to Mars or something, and then they were attacked by bandits, and when they came back, they were angry with Abu Mashar and accused him of using magic or being involved in the attack somehow. It has like a lot of great anecdotes that make you realize this is like a real person, a real astrologer, just like you or I living in the ninth century in Baghdad, you know, doing yeah. astrology. Yeah, there's a there's an example where um, uh, I think he was predicting length of life or inter he was interpreting a chart for a client. So the client was there and he was interpreting the chart. And uh, after the client leaves, the students turn to Abu Mashar and say, "Why did you tell him that? That's not what the rules are. So that's not what the rules say. You're not supposed to say that. Why did you?" And he gives this, "Yeah, well, this is why I say these things. And sometimes you need to tell the client this. And so you're really getting, um, you're really getting an intimate view." of the student-teacher relationship as in these live consultations. Well, Shadan says that Abu Mashar did not know his own nativity. Mm. And um, now you could say, well, how, you know, um, maybe, maybe not. But Shadan then follows up and he says, uh, Abu Mashar had some health problems. And it was because he didn't know his nativity that he had to cast horary charts or a horary chart to diagnose some of his problems. So this wasn't just a statement uh, about him not knowing his nativity. Shadan then gives an explanation and says what Abu Mashar had to do because of that. And um, that's a pretty that's a pretty uh, strong statement. And there's other there's other reasons to think. Um, that there's something wrong with there. Are, there's other reasons to think that this is not Abu Mashar's chart or to doubt it, but to me, that's one of the strongest. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, I mean, Pingree had maybe just noticed in the Hellenistic tradition how common it was for astrologers to like include their own charts. And I think Valens's chart is not even explicitly said to be Valens, as he just Pingree inferred that that was his chart because he kept using it over and over again. For very specific things, um, yeah. So who? But oftentimes, it's like we never know for sure. There is another problem too, and that is that um, in the various manuscripts of this that describe this chart and give the positions, the planetary positions, mm. the manuscripts give contradictory, the contradictory positions, and I don't mean I just mean that you know. One of them says the sun is at two degrees, and the other says three degrees. I mean that in some cases, um, the planet is in totally the wrong sign, or is 20 degrees away. Uh, and so there is, and, and the, the example itself that he goes through contradicts his own method. He goes through an example chart and doesn't use the, the very method that he describes in the rest of the book. So something's really wrong here, and it could be a chart that was 
reworked later, or he was adapting it from a previous book. The, the date on the chart um, also is very close to the dates of some earlier caliphs that he knew personally or were alive in his lifetime. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to go with Shadan and say this is not Abu Mashar's chart until further notice. Okay. Uh, well, we'll have to check in in a few years and see how you feel about that. <laughs> um, maybe it was rectified or something. Maybe it's a rectified chart. But who who knows? Well, that's interesting. Well, that that could be too. That could be too. Well, because just you know, that's one of the biggest things that plagues an just an astrologer, a professional astrologer that doesn't know their chart. That becomes one of their lifelong things. Is like trying to figure out their mm-hmm. own nativity, and they like mm-hmm. rework it at different times in their life to, based on different criteria. But who knows? Um, one of the things, and I don't know if we can jump to this already, but like a huge thing that you deal with in the introduction is the house division issue and Abu Mashar's role in it and the importance of this text in terms of some of your ongoing research surrounding what happened with house division in the medieval period. And it, it seems like this is a very pivotal text in terms of that, right? Yeah. Um, one of the amazing discoveries in when I translated one of the missing books, it's actually both in, in book six and seven, which again, were not translated into Latin. He addresses house division, and we can see him, I would say, struggling with whole sign houses versus quadrant divisions. And for for quadrant houses, I'll just say divisions. Uh, To make it clear, I'll say signs and divisions. Um, You know, there was confusion. uh, and 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 various treatments in the ancient literature, but now in Abu Mashar we see him really um, grappling with this. Because, for example, perfections are a sign-based technique. Everyone agreed on that, and Abu Mashar himself says that. And yet they're also using divisions, and the cusps, as we know, don't always fall. On the expected sign, there's intercepted signs, there's two cusps on one sign. So these passages are about, well, what do you do? What do you do if the sign that you are want to work with has its associated cusp on a different sign? What do you do? And he goes through a number of examples in different techniques of, of, of what you should do. Okay. And it seemed like, from what I understood from your introduction, he was trying to use both whole sign houses and quadrant houses and kind of reconcile them, but then it gets kind of messy, kind of fast in different areas, and that he had a tendency then eventually to sometimes default to using quadrant houses when there was a conflict, which then naturally means that later astrologers following him would probably start preferring quadrant houses ultimately from that point forward as well. Is that right? Is that a good synopsis of sort of your introduction? Yeah. Uh, it gets it gets messy quickly. It's not fully consistent, or at least when there's a conflict, he seems to go go to cusps and divisions. One example uh, that and this is his example, um, is he says the fifth house, okay, the fifth sign would be the normal sign you'd want to perfect for perfecting the fifth house. But he says, what if the cusp is on the sixth sign? So you have two signs involved. Well, they also wanted to dire- use primary directions with houses, and for that you need a degree, like a cusp. So here's his answer. He says, perfect from both the fifth sign and the sixth sign, because that's where the cusp is, and then do primary directions from the cusp. Okay, so do so, every, everything or do both? You, yeah, you kind of do both. With the perfections, you do both signs. And you can figure out pretty quickly that this is not going to work because um, 
suppose the fifth sign is Scorpio, but the sixth is Sagittarius. Uh, you're talking about very different planets, very different types of signs. And when they profect, they will land at different kinds of places every year. So okay. it gets to be a mess. It's not consistent, but we can see him leaning towards cusps. But I think what we also need to say is the fact that he needed to explain this shows that there was no agreed upon answer in those days. That it was something people were wrestling with because he has to defend and explain like a tradition he's drawing on where perfections are by sign and potentially by whole sign houses, but that how to use them also partially in this other sort of quadrant framework and what happens when that runs into conflict with the sign-based framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, yeah, so so there there he needed to explain this, which means there was no agreement. Uh, there was a conflict here uh, between some of the techniques, how they worked, and what they wanted to do with them. And so he was trying to give his answer, uh, because if if everyone was doing quadrant divisions, they would uh, for everything, uh, they wouldn't have to explain anything. Um, if so, uh, but there's inconsistencies too because. At the same time that he's that he's trying to combine signs and divisions, um, you also have to ask: Well, how is he? Tr how do we apply this to the nativity? If we're using quadrant divisions, let's say to interpret transits, what are we doing in the nativity? Are we using signs or divisions? And he he doesn't give a complete answer. There are big blanks that, uh, to be consistent, he would need to fill in all the blanks, and there are blanks in his theory. So maybe he was still working some things out? Working some things out, things were in flux at that time. And to me, it's, it's an amazing thing to discover, because it seems that by the time we get into the Middle Ages, the days of whole sign houses are pretty much over. And... And they're over in a way that people might not have known there was even a problem, right? Because they the, didn't have the they didn't have these books of Abu Mishar that explain that there's a problem, right? And there's like reasons for that because you said in the introduction that by the 12th and 13th century, like Holstein houses is largely already out the door and it's largely already quadrant houses, and that part of the issue is that that you discovered is a um. In this Latin translation of Abu Mashar, or in the Arabic translation, he has this whole discussion of this issue. But then, when the Arabic text was translated into Latin, that those specific chapters were not in the Latin version. They didn't make it into the translation, so that the later astrologers of the later medieval period, from the 12th, 12th century forward, would not be aware that this was like a debate that Abu Mashar was like dealing with and wrestling with. But then, secondarily, um, you said that when you translated the Arabic, that he has specific terms that he uses, and his terminology is subtly different when he's talking about whole sign houses versus quadrant houses. So that if you're reading the Arabic, it's it, it becomes very clear. But if you're reading it in the Latin translations, a lot of that nuance and detail just drops out of the text, right? Right. The um, in Arabic, they had cl clear distinction in vocabulary that shows you they absolutely knew the difference. Uh, and in chart examples, they would they would use this vocabulary. So when they would talk about whole sign houses, they called it houses by counting or by number. Because once you know what the rising sign is, you just like can count with your finger, so to speak, sign by sign. So mm -hmm. those are houses by counting. But for quadrant divisions, they call them houses by division, that's one word, or by equation. Uh, I know there's a couple of other, uh, at least one other term. So in some chart examples, they'll say, well, you know, pl this planet is in the ninth by counting, but it's in the eighth by division. And that only happens when you are trying to combine both systems or taking note of both systems. 
Okay. So, and all this is really interesting to me because I think it it means or it feels like to me then we're back in a situation where I know very early on, like twenty years ago, Rob Hand, I think in his monograph on Holstein houses and his little short booklet that I think it was like a mountain astrologer article originally speculated that Abu Mashar was the turning point where quadrant houses seemed to take over past that point forward. And he it seemed like a speculation at the time that he thought Abu Mashar was the pivotal figure in terms of influencing that. And and based on this text, it almost seems like that might be partially the case, um, partially due to a deliberate, some deliberate decisions on Abu Mashar's part um, in sometimes favoring quadrant houses when there was a conflict, but also perhaps due to some accidents of history as well, such as portions of his discussion not making it into the Latin translations or the language getting sort of flattened when it was translated from Arabic into Latin in some instances. Well, yeah, think of uh, I mean, think of how some of the medieval astrologers might have approached things if they knew there were alternatives. Uh, some of them might have debated whether he was right or wrong, or tried to complete his theory or something like that. But they would have known that something was happening. Instead, they didn't know anything was happening. Okay. Now, I mean, that it, makes it more sense mean, than in terms of why the shift was so sudden then, because they could have were just like drawing on part of this massive book that was like the book on solar revolutions, and as far as anybody knew, it was all just just largely quadrant houses. Could be, could be, could have play, played a role certainly. Yeah, sure. Um, now I'm now the, we have to we have to admit, um, not admit, but we have to. Uh, um, Acknowledge that that this whole sign and division issue is a permanent one because of astronomy. It's the fact that the the uh, zodiac or ecliptic is oblique from the um, celestial equator, so signs rise uh, at different angles, and so they're not always going to fall on the expected or associated. Um, you know, axes. And that's an inevitable part of astronomy. Uh, but that doesn't, so that it could be that signs and divisions are used for different reasons. Uh, it could be, for example, that um, in a horary chart, let me just kind of pause, uh, you know, propose this. Um, they had different, they had different uh, and specialized terminology for whether a planet was moving towards an axial degree like the MC, and if it was moving past it. They had different terminology, and they explicitly associated that with things in time, how things come to be in time and pass away over time. And in horary charts, we are not generally talking about the whole life. We're talking about something that's happening right now in time. Well, it could be that quadrant divisions are especially uh, appropriate for horary astrology because it has to do with something that's happening right now in time. Uh, so that divisions do something special by themselves but they especially do it in a branch like horary, whereas they don't act in the same way in a natal chart. That's just some ideas, and I'm, I'm actually working on what could be a solution, but these are some things to think about, and it's it doesn't have to be all one or the other. Right, yeah, um, sure. And I was just thinking in response to that, though, about like Masha Allah and Saul and how they're often using whole sign houses in the early Part of the Hori tradition, so it's a little bit mixed there, even in, in the Hori tradition. Mm -hmm. It's mixed, but actually, um, there are passages in the Saul book that show, I think, an attempt to solve the problem, and I'm working on that right now. So we'll see what happens, but um, it, but it's good to know that we are not just. Picking, plucking this out of the air and uh, making this up. Um, this is a major astrologer with lots of students, famous guy, and he is recognizing, along with his colleagues, that there's a problem, and he's trying to solve it. 
Yeah, and we're just picking up on that issue that was left unresolved, or where somebody was trying to resolve the issue back in the ninth century, and now that issue has suddenly come back into the community, and astrologers are once again wrestling with it in the same way that he was. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and maybe with the benefit of hindsight, and with access to more texts, we can find a kind of solution. Sure. So let's get back to solar returns and let's get into sure. the specific techniques and let's talk a little bit about some interpretive principles if we can. Do you think um, it's time to jump sure. into that in terms of like how would Abu Mashar, or what are some of the rules that we can take from Abu Mashar about he, how he might approach a solar return chart in terms of some of the basics? Yeah, one. Um, so one of the main principles is that. Uh, in order for something from the nativity to flow on through into real time, um, is that you want there to be some sort of repetition or reinforcement uh, happening in the real time technique that, that repeats or draws out features of the nativity. So this can happen in a number of ways. For example, if you have, let's say you have Venus in the your natal 10th. Now that's something that is there for all of life. But in the solar return, if the solar return Venus is in the solar return 10th in that chart, then we have a repetition. We have a continuity of meaning between two charts. And so you might expect that some of that natal 10th house Venus becomes expressed in that year. So that could be an example of um, uh, repetition and reinforcement. Okay, um, so rule rule one is like look for repetitions across the natal chart and the solar return chart, because mm -hmm. if that happens, sometimes it's going to um, accentuate or draw out those placements that were promised in the birth chart, and perhaps mean they're going to be um, more prominent in that that specific year. Mm -hmm. Another example is suppose that you um, by profection. Uh, you have, um, by profection, you have the profection come to your natal Saturn. This is an example he uses. So it comes to your natal Saturn, and let's say your natal Saturn is in Gemini. So that means that Saturn, the meaning of natal Saturn, will be activated because the profection is telling you this is one of the Time Lords this year. But as we know from the ancient um, rules, one of the ways in which uh, planets' um, expression is more consistent is if uh, they can see their own see their own house, see their own sign. So, for example, he says, if this profection comes to your natal Saturn, well, the natal Saturn will be activated, but a lot depends on whether Saturn in real time at the solar return is aspecting Gemini. Because if he can see his natal position, then he can sort of actively manage and monitor and modulate that natal meaning and sort of bring it forth. Whereas if he's in a, in a sign where he can't see his natal position, he's not able to properly manage it. So Something Saturnian will happen. It will be part, at least part of the natal meaning, but maybe not exactly how you ex expect, or it won't uh, be fully manifested, or it will only appear for a time and then disappear. So um, configuration, how the solar return planet compares to its natal position, that will matter. Okay, so if the solar return planet is, if you have a planet activated as a time lord, then you next want to see if that planet in the solar return chart is aspecting by a major aspect its natal position in the birth chart. Right, uh, and then there's there's other other things that again follow general principles. Uh, you might have some planet that's activated as a time lord in the nativity. Well, in this in the solar return, find that planet. If it is highly angular, let's say near the midheaven, uh, that shows that 
it's not only a time lord, but it's highly stimulated for that year. Because that's where it, it's, it's in a stimulated position in the solar return. But he says if it's cadent, if it's past the midheaven, so it's become weak, it might be something like a plan that you have, but you never really put the effort to make it happen. It might only be a wish or something that you're thinking about, but it doesn't fully manifest. So it's activated, but it kind of stays um, at such a low level of energy, it doesn't rise to the level of uh, action. And that's if what again? What is the technical? If, the, if, that, if that planet is angular, you know, moving towards one of the axes in the solar return versus being dynamically cadent. Okay. So things like uh, whether the whether the Time Lord in the Revolution is in its own dignity or not, if it's harmed by a, a malefic or not, all of these things will tell you how well and fully that natal promise can get passed on into real time. Okay, so it's often all a lot of this is just relating it back to. The natal chart and figuring out whether the solar return positions are accentuating and almost like enabling the promise of the planetary placements in the birth chart, or whether they're somehow negating or not supporting, or um, trying to think of the, the other term for that to, to rebuff almost the positions or the, the promise that the planet wants to signify in the birth chart. Right. And you can see this, this follows directly from the theory of prediction. Because if you need a real-time technique to describe the real conditions of the event, you need to compare real-time to the nativity. And that's exactly what you're doing when you're seeing how the Time Lord compares to its position in the, in the revolution. Okay. Um, and another thing that's really important is the solar return ascendant, right? Yeah. The solar return ascendant... Uh, uh, First of all, it will activate some natal position. So if your solar return ascendant is Sagittarius, then you have to see what your natal Sagittarius was. Was it the ninth house? Eleventh house? Because it means those topics will be arising this year. So um, it's one way of activating things in the nativity. It also has to do with the person's outlook and uh, mood and sense of well-being in that year, so it's a temporary ascendant for them. Okay, so it's temporary ascendant. It's activating the natal house. It's also activating uh, natal planets in that sign, right? Okay, and um, what about the ruler of that uh, of the ascendant in the solar solar return chart? Is that given more weight? Yeah, it, planets in the ascendant. Planets in it, of course, would you'd look at first, but the Lord of that ascendant would show more of what the native is interested in and is doing. And again, you have to compare those charts because suppose the Lord of that ascendant is in the um, solar return ninth. So that shows an interest, let's say, in uh, travel and foreigners and education. Well, that solar return ninth was a natal house. Again, let's suppose that the solar return ninth is Gemini. Well, Gemini occupied, occupied a natal position. Suppose it was the natal um, fifth. That means that the native is interested in travel, or, or something about the native's life has to do with travel, because it's the solar return ninth. But because that Gemini was the natal fifth, the children are involved too. So this comparison can, and what's being activated, what's being drawn on, uh, it's like a back and forth process, going back and forth between the two charts. And it can get complicated and overwhelming if you, if you aren't disciplined with it. Yeah, that's one of the things um, with this book that it he uses so many different techniques, and there's so much going on that there's a potential to get a little bit overwhelmed just in terms of the number of different angles that he approaches things. 
Yeah, and in fact, um, in the in the in the book on monthly techniques, it gets so complicated because you not only have natal things that you are, you know, uh, perfecting and doing annual revolutions, and then you're but you're also casting monthly charts. It can be so complicated that at the at the end of the chapter, he gives three quick and dirty methods to kind of get you in the chart real quick, look at a few major things, and then pull out before things get too crazy. Okay. Which I think is really nice because it shows that um, he was thinking like an astrologer. He wasn't just writing, uh, copying down techniques and kind of elaborating on some notion he had. He knew you had to get into the chart with a client, get into the essentials. So it, that's another window into his thought as an astrologer. Okay. Um, should we talk about that a little bit? His monthly uh, treatment of like monthly techniques? Yeah. Okay. So um, this is mainly dealt with in book nine, right? Yeah. Uh, one of the missing books. That was missing in the Latin version, but that's in the Arabic version. Right. Okay, so right, this is new, new Latin. material. Yeah, it'll be new for everyone except for a few people who have read it in the last thousand years. <laughs> right. Um, so anybody that hasn't read it, it ha doesn't read Arabic basically, and hasn't been reading the Arabic texts. Um, so wh what's the approach, or what does he do in order to approach monthly predictions within the course of a year? So some of some of he has he has actually seven special indicators. So this is where things I've I've added tables that explain each one so that you don't get lost. Some of these monthly techniques come from the nativity or the solar return. So for example, uh, you do annual perfections one sign per year. Well, once you get to one sign. Let's let it be Scorpio. Scorpio is not only the sign of the whole year, but it's also the first month of the year. Then the next sign will be the second month of the Scorpio year. The next okay, sign so will he, be the he third uses, month. Like that mo monthly, that monthly approach to perfections uh, that like Paulus does instead of some of the other variants that other people like. I think Ptolemy does something different, right? Yes, he rejects Ptolemy's method. Um, ex he explicitly rejects it. So he does monthly perfections with the nativity. But then you have a natal chart, or the solar return chart. Well, the solar return chart is both a an entire year. You can also perfect from its ascendant. But then the whole solar return is also the first month of the year, so every month you can cast a new monthly revolution chart. Okay. So the so, question is, is it, like the solar return chart at that point is like the birth chart in that it's in giving indications for the entire year. But then the question that you sometimes have is like, well, when is, are those specific things going to happen during the course of that mm -hmm. year? Right. With each of these charts, we're narrowing down to smaller amounts of time. So by the time we get to monthly charts, we're dealing with, uh, in any monthly chart, you're dealing with four different ascendants, for example, all at the same time. A monthly perfection in the nativity, a monthly perfection in the solar return, uh, a, uh, an ascendant in the monthly revolution, and no, maybe so. Maybe it is only three. Uh, so it can get kind of crazy. So you need rules to tell you where to start and where to go from there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's partly why I've added these tables. And he's explicit about here are the rules that you follow. How can you tell when something in the in the solar return? In which month will it manifest? Okay, got it. Um. And how is the monthly return chart calculated? It is calculated 
for the time when the sun uh, comes into the corresponding degree of every other sign. So if your natal sun is at 15 Gemini, mm -hmm. then every solar return will be when he returns to 15 Gemini. But every monthly chart will be when he's at 15 Cancer, 15 Leo, 15 Virgo. So the corresponding degree in each of the other signs. Okay, so he's not doing like a lunar return chart? Right, he's not doing that. Okay, does he do any other planetary return charts? Or is that more of a modern notion as well? Not, not like that. He notes when planets return to their natal position at a solar return, but he doesn't do something like um, a Venus return chart. He doesn't do those. Okay. And, and that's actually treated as really important, though, when a natal planet does return back to its natal position in the solar return chart? Yeah, it's kind of surprising. He has um, uh, he explains what it means when a planet uh, returns to its natal position or even its own sign, and what it means if it's applying to its natal position or separating, how close it is, and he even has some timing techniques for how long that planetary return will last for, including combinations of including combinations of transits. So. Yeah, it's uh, uh, I haven't worked out those uh, techniques in practice yet, but he ha uh, has very interesting things to say about them. Okay, and um, you mentioned applying aspects, and that was something that was mentioned at one point that there's certain things that are taken into account to help prioritize what's more important versus what's less important, and that's one of the things taken into account in was it just the solar return charts that applying aspects tend to be given more weight and more focus? Yeah, an applying uh, aspect, especially the closer the be or, or, or a conjunction we're talking about. Uh, so an applying conjunction uh, is going to be more actualized uh, than a separating one. Uh, the closer it is, the stronger, um, especially if it's you know within uh, orbs or within the same bound. Okay. Um, yeah, and there's a lot there. One of the other things that this book deals with that's very unique and important and influential is also the technique that's sometimes known as uh, Fedaria, right? Yeah. Okay. What is that? That's like a medieval Time Lord technique, essentially, right? Yeah, it seems to be a Persian technique. Um, it's a Time Lord technique that separates people out into day or diurnal births and nocturnal births. And for diurnal births, you have a certain series of time lords that start with the sun. And the sun is a time lord for a certain number of years, then Venus, Mercury, and so on. And uh, for nocturnal births, it starts with the moon. She's your first time lord at the beginning of life, then uh, Saturn, Jupiter, and so on. So it's a different order of time lords based on the sect of your chart. And this technique also includes the nodes as Time Lords, which is a good indication that it might have come from India. Right, where the nodes were given more importance relatively early on, as well as in the Persian tradition that was then sort of influenced by the Indian tradition. Right, some kind of uh, Persian-Indian crossover, that's probably the origin of this technique. Okay. So it's not based so unlike other unlike the Greek techniques that are based on the motion of the heavens, like distributing through the bounds or profections that go sign by sign, this is a sect based uh, approach. Um, and it goes in the Chaldean order of planets in order of speed. Okay. And really quickly, the years of the planets. Uh, the sun is 10 years, Venus is 8, Mercury is 13, the moon is 9, Saturn is 11, Jupiter is 12, Mars is 7, the north node is 3, and the south node is 2, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes 75 years. Uh, I can identify what could be the reasons for some of those years, 
but also if you pair up the planets in certain ways, uh, you will get the number 19. Uh, so if you line up the planets, and I have a diagram where I sort of fold them over themselves, you'll see that there are uh, recurring patterns in the numbers that someone was inspired uh, to do this. Um, some of the numbers I can't explain, uh, like the Mercury number, but um, but yeah, someone was creating a... In a way, it's a more... I want to say it's a more, for lack of a better word, a more cosmic conception of the human being. Because again, it's not based on the actual order of the signs and planets in your chart. It's based on um, the, the cosmic scheme of the heavens and day and night. Right. But he emphasizes that you do need to pair it with prof profections. So it's, it's, um, it's not totally abstract. Um, you are supposed to uh, uh, combine it with profections and revolutions. Um, and I don't know if that's just his idea, because he wants to kind of do everything at once, or if that was what the originators of the technique wanted. Mm, okay. And he then becomes, does he become one of the primary sources for that Time Lord technique, basically, or one of the most influential sources? I think he did for later people, but we know that he did not make up most of these delineations because uh, Burnett and uh, uh, Charles Burnett and a guy with the last name of Alhamdi, uh, they translated passages from a, a later compiler who clearly st who, who, who attributes most of these paragraphs, uh, some of them read almost word for word, to al Andrzegar who was an earlier Persian astrologer. So what seems to have happened is that al Andrzegar was part of a Persian tradition uh, where they uh, either um, inherited or invented Fardaria, or Fardars, and um, that was passed on and preserved by Abu Mashar, but then he added some of his own um, paragraphs to some of the um, interpretations. Okay, got it. Yeah, because that's a, uh, it's like a, it works very similar to a Time Lord technique, um, but it's not, at least as far as the surviving sources that we know from the Greek and Latin tradition, a technique that, that existed there. So we just sort of assume that it was developed in the Persian tradition. Right. Um, but it, because this later compiler um, uh, clearly attributes a lot of this to Al Andrzegar, it's pretty much confirmed that it was. Persians who were who were uh, promoting this, but by the time of Abu Mashar, I think a lot of Al Zagar's work uh, was lost, or uh, people were people didn't know they were reading Al Zagar. So a lot of the Fardaria material becomes identified with Abu Mashar. Okay, cool. Um, one other area and one other topic that's really fascinating because. Uh, Abu Mashar has almost like a, some personal discussion to the student in this section as he does talk about uh, longevity and, and the length of life technique at one point, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this also was missing in the Latin, and it's really too bad because it's both personal and kind of funny in a way. Um, it's a, a chapter on longevity techniques, predicting the length of life. And not just uh, the length of life, but also years in which there could be problems, even though it's not fatal. And um, <laughs> the chapter begins where he's directly addressing the reader, who I guess was his students. And he says, you've been asking me to, to explain these techniques to you and tell you all about this. But then he... Um, he, he admonishes the students, saying, you know, you want to know all of this, but by w what right do you have to go rummaging around in people's charts looking for this when all you're trying to do is satisfy your curiosity? All you're trying to do is look for something that's terrible. Mm. And uh, it shows that um, in a lot of ways, people don't change because 
I mean, how many astrologers, when they hear about something terrible on TV, they think, oh, I wonder what the chart looks like. And they're only doing it to satisfy their curiosity. And so he's, uh, he's, he's, um, he's pointing out that you shouldn't be so excited and so curious uh, to look for disasters in people's charts. But since you at least have to know about this, uh, here, here is how you go about it. Okay. That's really interesting. And as a almost like warning, um, you know, of that you might not be happy with what you find or that you really need to reflect on your reasons for wanting to know mm -hmm. to have that knowledge. Um, it's interesting to hear that coming from like a ninth century and medieval author. Yeah, it's it's the I mean it's the attitude of, you know, before you do this, who do you think you are mm. to ask these questions? Um, but he points out that um, one of the valuable things about this chapter is that he not only adds some new things uh, and new reflections and combines techniques and adds some fixed stars, but he says um, it's good for you to know the difference between a truly dangerous year and just an unpleasant one. And that's a valuable thing to know. Right, because astrologers can sometimes get um, messed up by that or get uh, obsessed about like a year that doesn't look very good, but sometimes their expectations of like how bad it's going to be being way off. Right, exactly. You can get a little too uh, upset and worked up about, a, about um, a difficult year, and so he's trying to explain the difference between them. Okay. Um, so he's and, and so he's and he's and he starts out by acknowledging the traditional longevity method of finding the releaser and housemaster, often called the high leg and the alcocoden. Mm -hmm. He acknowledges that, but he says that's not enough. You have to look at things like revolutions and uh, make these comparisons too. Okay, so he's sort of walking that line between the traditional approach versus this other approach that he's advocating in the book that's focusing on the importance of the real-time um, action of the solar return chart in manifesting almost the transits, basically. Right. That the, that the traditional technique of the housemaster and releaser is, and the way I put it, I think, in the book is it's like uh, actuarial tables, uh, length of life tables used in insurance. Um, you have your expected life expectancy, which is could be very close to the truth, but there's lots of things that can happen uh, to lengthen life or cut it short. So you can't just rely on that one thing to understand people's course of life. Right. Okay. Um, so, but otherwise, his approach is relatively standard in terms of determining the um, the releasing planet that is prominent in the chart that represents the vitality or life force of the native, and then directing it using primary directions until it hits mm -hmm. the rays of a malefic or something like that. Yeah, and uh, so you you find that re that planet that represents the life force, and you use primary directions or distributions really with it until it comes to something that looks real bad. Um, but again, to return to his theory of prediction, um, distributions are a time lord technique, mm -hmm. and time lords are not enough. We need a real-time technique as well. So that's why we can direct to something that looks bad, but then we need the real-time techniques to see in actuality how bad or good is it? Right, because then the real-time techniques like the solar return chart are also going to be activating and accentuating whatever the natal promise is. And so the, mm -hmm. there's already a question set up there of like, what is the natal promise of the birth chart? Does the birth chart say the person's going to die, you know, 80 years old, you know, when they fall asleep in their bed or something like that peacefully? Or does it indicate that there's, are there indications for a more difficult um, end to the person prematurely. 
Mm -hmm. And the real-time conditions should help time that and describe that. And after having uh, translated all this material, I started um, I started using this, and it looks like this is really valuable advice that could help um, explain some things in charts when you're looking at longevity that the other authors don't uh, don't talk about. Okay, awesome. Um, so does this become this doesn't become his primary tech treatment of length of life, right? He has other treatments, I'm sure. Yeah, he talks about it in other books, but I feel like um, I feel this is really valuable because he says a couple of times in this book, um, he says, I'm writing this in my old age. So he's writing this at the end of his career. He's giving you his fully thought out techniques. And I think also with this Treatise 9, or this last part with the longevity stuff, because he's responding to students, he's going to be more um, direct and kind of sum it up, sum up his approach, whereas in other books he might just be copying a technique from someone else. Sure. There's something about the personal, the personal touch, and, and he's explicitly giving advice in response to students that I think makes this special. Okay. So yeah, so maybe this was written later in his career than other some of his other 40 some odd works may have been. Um, and that's so fascinating just thinking of him as a teacher and him writing some of this for his students and keeping the student in mind as he was trying to like explicate some of these complicated doctrines. Mhm. Mm yeah, it it's uh I think between the his student Shavan, which I will translate that uh, those anecdotes and that material, between that and some of these other personal comments that he makes, I think Abu Mashar comes alive in a way that um, you don't really see in most of these older astrologers. We just don't have access to their to their everyday lives and, and biographies like we do with him. Yeah, definitely. Because like the further and further back you go in the history. It's like the less and less we know about some of these authors, even the really important ones like Dorotheus, we have almost no information about his life. Or you have somebody like Ptolemy, where we have his written works, but otherwise we don't know much else about him. And the later and later you go, you start to get more information about them, like the fact that Abu Mashar had a student who records those anecdotes about him, or he wrote all these books and talks about different anecdotes about being in his old age or what have you. And then like later. Mm -hmm. I've been studying like the Renaissance tradition more, and it's fascinating getting to Lily and actually having somebody that wrote a separate autobiography of his life. And it's interesting just right. getting more into the more modern period, how you learn more and more about astrologers the further you go. But that Abu Mashar is in this interesting like middle ground in terms of that. Mm -hmm. And I think as we um, as I uh, translate um, Saul's mundane works, which has mundane charts in it from his lifetime. Uh, that will help put him in a certain place. He, that will help put him uh, in in the midst of events, like we talked about in the uh, in our Saul interview, and then in the Masha Allah horary books that I'm going to translate, the new ones. Um, we'll learn maybe more about his clients and where he was and who he was dealing with, um, so we can get a more personal view somewhat, but it's not on the level of what we're getting with Abu Mashar. Yeah. Uh, well, that's really fascinating. And he's one of the most influential astrologers. I mean, I think Holden or somebody refers to him or, or cites him as being referred to as like the prince of the astrologers or of the medieval astrologers or something like that. Is that one of his like titles? I, th I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, well, well and, prince of the astrologers, I think Ptolemy might also have been called that too. Oh, yeah. Well, Ptolemy had a lot of titles, especially once you get to guys like Hephaestio, and he's like the truth loving Ptolemy and, and other stuff like that. Right. Um, but it seems like Abu Mashar, this is like an interesting month, like July, August, where Abu Mashar is having a bit of a revival because we have your book coming out, which is about to be released on August 9th. Uh, that's the electional chart we picked for the release of the book, as well as the release of this interview. 
But then we also had just in the past couple of months the full translation of like Burnett and Yamamoto's translation of the Greater Introduction as well. So it's like two of his biggest and most influential astrological works are suddenly coming out around the same time, relatively close together. Yeah. Yeah, there's something, I don't know, there's something weird about that that's kind of interesting historically. And who knows if he has some sort of like long term, 1000 year, like Time Lord thing being activated at this time. <laughs> right. Well, we'll have to cast the solar revolution, find a solar revolution or a transit to. We'll have to use his principles to see if they're, if we can make sense of it. Yeah, exactly. We've got to rectify that chart for him and see if we can solve that mystery 1000 years later. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of are there any other topics related to this related to Abu Mashar or um, just this approach to solar returns that's demonstrated in this book that's unique or useful that we should mention from the especially to modern astrologers who might be curious like why this is important or valuable. Well, one thing that really. Um once I started working out his theory of prediction based on statements that he makes, um, I hope that it will inspire people who don't use Time Lords uh, to use them and find find one, at least one, that you like. Perfections are the easiest, but find one uh, because, and then if if there are other people, especially traditionalists, who only focus on Time Lords, you need to find a real time technique. Um, I, it will round us out better as astrologers, but also if he's right, we're dealing, so to speak, with three levels of reality. And if we don't others understand all three levels and coordinate them together, um, we're not, we're not operating on all cylinders as astrologers. So I hope it will, um, inspire people to explore techniques that the, uh, haven't learned before and and make them feel like they could gain something important as astrologers from it. Brilliant. I think that makes sense. Um, awesome. So where can people find this book or how, the, how can they get it? They can find it on Amazon, uh, probably other online bookstores, um, but on Amazon. And if you are not in the United States, there are other Amazons in your country or in your region that you should find because uh, shipping from the U.S. Uh, internationally is very expensive. So find it uh, at your at your own country's online bookstores. Okay, so just do a search for uh, Abu Mashar on the revolutions of the years of nativities, and the book will be right. available online everywhere. From August 9th, 2019 forward. Yes. Cool. Uh, what else are you working on, or what's your next project now that you've just published like two major, huge translations of Arabic texts in the past few months? Well, my main project I'm working on now is trying to finish my natal course, which I'm hoping will be done by the end of the year, maybe. Um, but as far as, and, and this Abu Mashar book and the Saul book, the two books behind me, those are the two required texts. So the, the Saul book is for the delineation part of the course and Abu Mashar for the predictive part. But I'm also working on a translation of Firmicus, a translation of the Great Introduction by Abu Mashar of my own, mm -hmm. and uh, several other things. So um, Got some big things coming, but the main thing is my course, hopefully in the next six months. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I'm definitely looking forward to your translation of Firmicus. And I noticed in your introduction, you have such a lengthy introduction here that it's clear that this is like a preparatory text that is meant to be read alongside your course. So that's very exciting that this is like the final piece that you needed to put in place in terms of required reading for that for the students of, of medieval and, and traditional astrology. Yeah, I. Some people have asked why I didn't do a course earlier, and I guess there were a number of reasons for it. But when I finally did this book, 
and then realized that the students needed a guide to understand the techniques, especially since there's so much more, I realized, you know, it was good that I waited because people need, it's almost like this, this book and the way I did the introduction, it's designed for students. So I couldn't have done it until now anyway. Yeah. And you've been like every new translation, it's always something new that you're learning about the history of astrology and something is becoming clearer or more refined. And now you've really gone back to as far into the early sources as possible by going back to the original text and bypassing um, large parts of the Latin tradition by going straight into the Arabic. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it was really worth it ultimately. And that was a good call to make when you started heading in that direction earlier in this decade. Yeah, I had I had in the in the for the natal material, you know, I th I was thinking, well, what would be a good book? And I knew that the Book of Aristotle, the so-called Book of Aristotle, um, in Latin, had all this good material in it, but the writing was so, the writing, the Latin style is so awkward and a problem. But when I discovered Saul's book on nativities, I thought, well, this has all of it. Um, but I couldn't have translated it until the last few years. So again, maybe it's all happening in its own good time, and it's happening at the right time now. Um, so I'm very excited that these are coming out now, and um, we're getting a, 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 such a rich view of what was going on um, in this key period among these famous astrologers, and hope to um, uh, teach a new generation of students how to do all of this. Yeah, I mean, it's a very exciting time to be alive as an astrologer because I was just thinking yesterday that we have access to more texts now than from different eras of the astrological tradition than at any other time in the history of astrology, which is just overwhelming mm -hmm. to think about, especially because it wasn't that way, you know, three decades ago. We didn't have a lot from prior to the 20th century. And now, suddenly, due to people like yourself and, and your efforts and other people like James Holden or Robert Schmidt or what have you, suddenly we just have. Tons of texts of all of the most important texts from the past few thousand years of the history of astrology are suddenly available again for astrologers to study, and there's something incredibly unique and exciting about that. Yeah, it's exciting, and um, at the same time, we're I think we're at a transition point, and 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 it's not only your course, and it's it's Demetra's book that's come out recently, and it's my course. Um, we're producing the translations, but at some point the student really needs a guide to um, digest it all, to understand many authors, and to practice it. And I don't think until the last few years have we, uh, in the last few years, we've gotten to the point where, where we can really start doing that in a way we couldn't before. Yeah, definitely. Because some of us have been putting this stuff into practice for. A decade or two now, and so the lived it's it's become alive again. Like the tradition isn't just like this dead mm -hmm. thing that exists in books, but it's something that's been, um, you know, life has been put back into it, and it's like breathing again. Mm -hmm. Well, and I notice that even among uh, many astrologers today, uh, especially including younger astrologers who um, have learned some of the tradition, um, they have not. Been working with the material on an everyday basis, the way I have, and you do, and Demetra does, and other tra practicing traditional astrologers, especially the natal material. Um, the horary horary folks, especially in England, uh, they they don't have that problem. But with the natal material, um, there's fewer people who have been working with it on a daily basis, and so now's the time for people who are interested in traditional, uh, now's the time to jump in and start claiming it for yourself and really uh, working it. Definitely. Well, uh, this will give people a lot to work with. It's, like I said, 700 pages. It's packed with a ton of techniques that we sort of touched on in passing here and gave an overview in this interview, but I can't really even accurately convey like the scope of this book and just how much it goes into and how much detail it really gets into. It's quite Amazing in terms of that, so I definitely would recommend everybody get it because I, I, can, I also can't believe like how available this is. Like the fact that you can go to Amazon and buy 
um, this book for like $35 or whatever it is, and this is literally like the most important and influential text on solar returns in the past 2,000 years, and suddenly it's just like available again, and you can order it and get it delivered on Amazon Prime or what have you in two days is just mind blowing. So thank you for for doing that and all of the work that you put into this over the past three to four years, as well as the past ten years of learning Arabic so you could translate it. I think it was worthwhile. And just on behalf of the astrological community, thanks for for doing that for all of us. Well, I'm having a ball. Cool. All right. Well, uh, I look forward to having you back again um, next time for whatever your next text is. I hope it's Firmicus. I've been wanting a Firmicus translation forever because I know there's a lot of good stuff in Firmicus that you'll be able to draw out in terms of the language that nobody else could. Um, so we'll we'll return again next time for whatever your next book is. Sounds good. Look forward to it. All right. Well, I guess that's it for this episode of the Astrology Podcast. So thanks everybody for watching or listening, and we'll see you next time.